All the above are natural creations by the external energy of the Lord. Now hear from me about the creations by Brahma, who is an incarnation of the mode of passion, and who, in the matter of creation, has a brain like that of the personality of Godhead. Sattamo Mukya Sargastu Shadvidhasta Shrit Sham Chariha Vanaspat Yoshadhiblata Kuksara Virudhodrava The seventh creation is that of the immovable entities, which are of six kinds the fruit trees without flowers, trees and plants which exist until the fruit is ripe, creepers, pipe plants, creepers which have no support, and trees with flowers and fruits. All the immovable trees and plants seek their subsistence upwards. They are almost unconscious but have feelings of pain within. They are manifested in variegatedness. Responsibly, if anyone has access to the verse. Tirashtam mm. Ashtama Sarga. So starving shall be the home of them. A widow who read them a soul. A widow who read them a soul. Arnam Avido Bhuri Tamaso, Arnam Yahid Yavedinaham, Tirascham Ashtamat Sarga, 
Soshkam Vimshad Vidhomata Avido Bhuri Tamaso Ananya Vidya Vedina Tirashcham, species of lower animals, species of lower animals, Ashramaha, Ashramaha, the eighth, eighth. Saragaha, Saragaha, creation, creation, Saha, Saha, they are, they are, Ashtavimshad, Ashtavimshad, twenty-eight, twenty-eight, Vidha, Vidha, varieties, varieties, Mataha, Mataha, considered. Abhidaha, Abhidaha, without knowledge of tomorrow, without knowledge of tomorrow, Uri, Uri, extensive, Tamasaha, ignorant, Granagya, can know desirables by smell, can know desirables by smell, Hridi Avedinaha, can remember very little in the heart. The eighth creation is that of the lower species of life, and they are of different varieties, numbering twenty-eight. They are all extensively foolish and ignorant. They know their desirables by smell, but are unable to remember anything within the heart. Purple. In the Vedas, the symptoms of the lower animals are described as follows. Atetareshaṁ bhuṣuna asana pipāse evā bhigyāna na vigyātam vadantina vigyātam paśyantina vidu svastanam na dhokā lokā viti yadvā bhūri tamaso bhaguruṣa ghāne naiva jānanti hridyam prati svapriyam vasthveva vidanti bhojana shayanādhyartam grhanam Lower animals have knowledge only of their hunger and thirst. They have no acquired knowledge, no vision. Their behavior exhibits no dependence on formalities. Extensively ignorant, they can know their desirables only by smell. And by such intelligence only can they understand what is favorable and unfavorable. Their knowledge is concerned only with eating and sleeping." End quote. Therefore, even the most ferocious lower animals, such as tigers, can be tamed simply by regularly supplying meals and accommodations for sleeping. Only snakes cannot be tamed by such an arrangement. Om <laughs> 
Asmai Shri Gurude Namaha So we have this list of creations, um, what's being described as natural creations, starting with the Mahatattva, and then once you have a platform to enter, the Mahatattva uh, is the platform, the Mahatattva. Then you get false ego, you get the senses, you get knowledge, and with the senses, it says, comes the sense objects. We read about all of this in the previous canto and briefly in the third canto as well. Mm -hmm. And then the controlling demigods. Mm -hmm. Ah, and the sixth creation, the ignorant darkness of the living entity by which the master acts as a fool. This ignorant darkness by which the master acts as a fool is a covering of the living entity, mm -hmm. the covering of ignorance. Um, this was mentioned in the last verse that these hridi um, avedina, let's see how it's said exactly. Yeah, hridi avedina can remember very little in the heart. The Supreme Lord is situated in the heart as Paramatma, and He's guiding the living entities' wanderings, Brahma and Sarvabhutani, He's guiding the wanderings of the living entities, and those who are in the lower species of life, Tirashchita, um, the lower animals, as stated in Itareshaam. Atetareshaam, the verse quoted in the purport, begins Atetareshaam. Itara, we get this Anvayad um, Itaratashchate. In the opening verse of Srimad Bhagavatam, also, that which is directly known, Anvayad, and Itara, that which is indirectly known. This word Itara shows up several places in Gita as well. Itara, the common people, the general masses, I'm unknown by the common people. Um, Itra also means lower. So these lower animals, Tirashchita, um, Atitareshtam in the purple, they're covered more by this potency of the Lord, mm, this sixth creation, this covering by which the foolish living entity acts as the master. Of course, that's particularly indicated for human beings who have the option to go one way or the other. On one hand, one is very covered uh, when one's bound by the three modes of material nature, but when the living entity takes the approach of Nanda Maharaj, who says, Karmanam Brahmyamananam Yetra Kvapishvara He says, by your desire, Echeya, Kva api, wherever uh, you direct my wanderings by the results of my own karma, let all my auspicious activities and all my mangala uh, charitaradana and all my offerings of charity, let all of these things allow me to remember you. So this is the mood of the devotee, that however you have me wander in this material world, let it somehow guide me back to you. Whereas those bound by the material nature is this ignorant covering of the foolish living entity who desires to act independently, then he becomes bound, or she becomes bound, by the three modes of material nature and acts as itra, as the common people or, or some lesser animal species who are hridyavedinaha, who are covered within the heart. Their wanderings are directed by the Supreme Lord, but um, restricted by the modes of material nature. 
तिरश्चाम अष्टम सर्ग सोष्ठवा विंशद्विधो मत अभिधो भूरी तमसो घ्राणम्या हृदयवेदिना घ्राणम्या they can know their desirables by smell this is mm, of course all the senses are very powerful the example is given that the deer is captured by the hunter by its ears it hears the sweet sound of the hunter's flute and is captured the elephant so powerful is captured by a she elephant on the opposite side of a pit the um, fish is captured by its desire to eat the bait and thus get hooked because of its tongue and becomes captured and has to die and here we're getting this example grhananya that they know their desirables by smell grhananya tas pagudram grhananya tas pagudram vicheshtate there's a verse that says that um, Prabhupada states that one is in an embarrassed condition uh, when one is being dragged about by the various senses. One cannot be a servant to all the senses at once and yet they're all grabbing our attention simultaneously. Each sense wants to be satisfied. And although we continue to faithfully serve these miserly masters, uh, they never let up. They don't say, okay, you've done good service. Now you are the master. Now you get to control. Um, no. The second you satisfy it, it wants more. And the subsequent attempts are always less enjoyable than the first. You can only eat so much. You can only hear the same song so much before you think, oh, let me never hear that song again. It's become Certain hackneyed, yeah, good word. Uh, certain songs, especially during festival seasons. I remember I was caught in a layover in New Jersey when I was trying to fly home for Christmas break and the snow had stopped the planes. And so I spent a couple of days in the airport and me being the impractical person that I am, never seek comfort because it would cost money. And so I just laid on the floor and every, I'd say, 20 square feet, no joke, is a speaker, and they're blasting Christmas songs the entire two days, day and night, and it felt like a sort of purgatory. It felt like a hell, and I just thought, let me never hear Christmas carols again for the rest of my life. And yet, we chant Hare Krishna every day, and it never becomes hackneyed. The spiritual sound vibration is ever fresh, it's not different from Krishna himself. Mm. So this, mm, I sort of have it written out of context, but mm, I had it in my notes when I was traveling with my spiritual master one time. He said, repetition is also advancement in Krishna consciousness. I don't remember the exact context, but it works in this context. A repetition of the Maha Mantra is advancement, whereas repetition in the material world is a sign of insanity, that you do the same thing and expect different results. Is that an Einstein quote? I think so. It's attributed. It's attributed to him. It's uh, possibly apocryphal, but uh, attributed to Einstein is that an insane man will perform the same activities again and again and expect a different result. We've already demonstrated so clearly our inability to lord it over material nature. Can't even control our own aging. We've had extensive talks about time in the past couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. This time factor progressively moving us on to our ultimate demise or the demise of the body. And we have no control over it. We have no control over the material elements. We have hardly control over our own minds and intelligence. And yet we think, oh, if we just keep doing the same thing, it will give us a good result. That's insanity. Mm -hmm. So, grhananya, uh, to know our desirables by smell isn't sufficient to conquer over material energy. 
One is to be considered bhuri tamasa, extensively ignorant, if that's their method of acquiring knowledge. Our knowledge can be acquired by hearing from the spiritual people, from the sadhus. So let's see. The opening verse it really struck me. Very nice, uh, very nice description. Lilayam hari medhasa. That Lord Brahma has a brain like that of the personality of Godhead. Shiva glorifies Krishna uh, to the prachetas when he's speaking to them. He glorifies Krishna as akunta medhasa, uh, one whose intelligence cannot be checked. Akunta, unlimited intelligence. So Krishna has unlimited intelligence. His intelligence applies to all fields, but to even have um, intelligence like the Lord in one aspect is such a wonderful glorification. That Lord Brahma has the intelligence of Krishna and the capacity of the creation of this world is high praise. Lord Brahma being the greatest living entity in this universe is being glorified here as having a brain like that of the personality of Godhead. And this means one with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. When devotees talk about this sort of oneness, mm. that one can merge with the Lord in quality, in, in purpose, to become one with the Lord in purpose means to serve the Lord, serve His purpose. And because Brahma has um, so faithfully done so, he's achieved a position equal to the Supreme Personality of God in this regard, by the mercy of the Lord. And um, similarly, we can receive this blessing by serving faithfully the orders of our spiritual masters, uh, serving faithfully the instructions of Srila Prabhupada. Uh, we get the blessings by which we can be unlimitedly empowered in devotional service. And what is that unlimited power? How does it manifest? Well, originally it manifests as the ability to conquer the mind, conquer the intelligence, start with home base. <laughs> the, um, when Arjuna is talking about lust, he says, I think it's more difficult to conquer the sense. It's more, it's, it would be easier to round up the wind than to mm, control the senses. Vayoriva Suduskar. It's as difficult to control as the wind. And Krishna says that yes, but by suitable practice it's possible. This lust has taken strategic positions within the body. It's uh, conquered the heart, the mind. It's taken strategic, military, sort of military terminology. There are certain centers in the body that have greater capacity to control our movements. And this lust has found its sitting place in these strategic places. Um, but by the mercy of the spiritual master, by the mercy of uh, Krishna, one can kick it out and replace it with devotional service. And have Hari Medhasa, intelligence, like that of the Supreme Personality of God. It means not affected by the modes of material nature, spiritual intelligence. Then we get this nice description of the seventh creation, immovable living entities, six kinds of trees, creepers. I don't have much to say on the topic, but it's nice to see this um, delineation, how perfect is Shubhan Bhagavatam that it can break things down so scientifically, uh, albeit briefly. You know, a few things are mentioned. When the birds are mentioned, a few different types of birds. When, when each thing is mentioned, a little sample is given. Of course, a, a, a comprehensive study of these topics isn't necessary within the scope of discussing devotional service, but still, some a nod in the direction is given, each of these things, just to give it scientific veracity. It's quite quite wonderful. Um, there's creepers, there's creepers which have no support, there's trees with flowers and fruits, trees with um, just fruits. Hmm. 
trees and plants which exist until the fruit is ripe. Nice. And then we have Utsrup Dasas Tamapraya Anta Sparsha Visheshana. I found this interesting that Anta Sparsha, Prabhupada writes in the translation as although these plants and trees are mm, almost unconscious, they have feelings of pain within. Anta Sparsha. Anta Sparsha means they're experiencing touch within, they're experiencing mm, pain and pleasure within. But that Prabhupada points out, just pain means that pain and pleasure in the material world is all pain. You're not getting any enjoyment in the material world, even if even if the plant temporarily experiences some nice warmth yeah, with the sun. Yeah. Even if the tree experiences the warmth of the sun for a moment, one could consider this a sort of pleasure, but it's uh, pleasure in the material world means temporary relief from pain. So, and what kind of pleasure is that? Just a little moment of warmth, a little bit of light. When you look at what's happening in material, we went to, when Bali and Danya were visiting, we went on the Manoa Falls Trail. It's relatively easy, just a couple miles. And as you walk in, there's all these grand Albicia trees. We have a lot of different types of albizia trees. They're all in the bean family. Any tree that you see has those long pods with beans in them, including monkey pods, uh, tree beans. Those are those big ones you see at Ho'omaluvia Garden, those big pods. They're all types of albizias. And they're grand. They're all giant. Um, we have some amazing monkey pods just at the corner of um, Wiley and where it meets is that part of Koala Way, Koala Loops? There's a huge, huge monkey pod there, and a couple more across from Ma'e Ma'e. And all of these grand, grand trees, um, they're being enveloped on, mono, on the Manoa Trail. You see they're enveloped by creepers being strangled. It's this sort of battlefield of nature. It's amazing. You see the, the giants being taken down, the sun being blocked out. There's this constant, endeavor for, for um, sunshine, sunshine for, for space, for, yeah, it's a, it's a battleground. So Antasvarsha, but they're not screaming and waving their branches like the Ents of Lord of the Rings, they're um, experiencing things within, Anta, Antasvarsha, and Prabhupada says they have these feelings of pain within. Limited consciousness. These living entities. Three different types are are described. You know, like the um, embryo within the womb, like the um, dust on a mirror, like smoke over fire. Levels of consciousness. The trees are very low level of consciousness. And then there's tirascham, species of lower animals. Uh, Twenty eight different types, and this is the eighth creation. They're all extensively foolish and ignorant. Bhuri tamasa. Ate tereshaam poshana ashana pipase. Eva abhivigyan. So, Eva, only abhivigyan. Their knowledge extends only as far as ashana pipase, as far as hunger and thirst. Itara, these lower um, pashuna animals. Hmm. They have no acquired knowledge, no vision. Na vigyatam badanti na. Vigyatam pashyanti. They can, let's see. Their behavior exhibits no dependence on formalities. What a nice description. Let's see that. How is that in Sanskrit? Na vidus shvastanam na loka loka According to time and place, we behave in a certain way. My Guru Maharaj once pointed out that in the, sometimes when you're on the New York subway, um, a group of rowdy hooligans will come whooping and hollering, and bust into the train, and act as if no one else exists. There's no understanding of decorum. They either haven't been taught or they're dismissive. They don't care. Very self-centered um, 
<clears throat> we are going to act as we like and everyone else can simply adjust. This is the uh, nature of an animal, of a lower species, someone who has no dependence on formalities. I remember I had a, a long discussion with a friend in high school, I was trying to explain the unique position of human beings that they can understand oh, who is God, they can understand their relationship with God. And my friend said, why do you give human beings this unique ability? How do you know the dolphins and, and other creatures aren't worshipping God? How do you know? And here, it's very clear. It's so easy to see. They have no dependence on formalities. They have no um, social understanding. They don't exhibit higher intelligence. They exhibit intelligence, grano, granagya as far as their desirables for smell. And, it's, and it shows the mentality of this person with whom I was discussing, that if they don't see a difference, then they're on that level. The only way you can see a difference is if you're above that level. You know, as long as you're um, on the foothills of the mountain, you know, everything looks really, you can kind of look up and, like, what's, what's New York City to an ant? He sees everything sort of in that lower dimension. But to a human being or from a helicopter, suddenly you see everything as it is. So this person, on the, basically on the level of intelligence of an animal, sees no difference between themselves and an animal. I sleep, they sleep. I eat something, they eat something. Everything is experienced. It's experiential knowledge. It's not taken from higher knowledge. When Dhruva Maharaj finally sees mm, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he says, uh, how is that? Tiryan, tirash, yeah, just like this word we have, uh, Tirashcham, um, Tiryan, these lower animals, Tiryan, Naga, Dvijasari, Sripadi, Vadaitya, Martyadi, Bhi, Parichitam, Sadhasad, Visheshesham. All these living entities I've witnessed, I've seen them, Sadhasad, Visheshesham, all these varieties, uh, manifest and unmanifest, we've got. Um, the animals, we've got dvija, birds, we've got sarisarpa, different types of reptiles, devas, great dem demigods, daityas, the demons, martyadibi, we have um, so many different types of humans, parichitam, they're um, situated everywhere, sadasadvishesham, sometimes manifested, sometimes unmanifested, in great variety. Mm -hmm. Ah, rupam stavishtam ajate mahadadya nekam. They're all caused by the total material energy. The, this mahatattva, this first creation, uh, first natural creation that we heard about a few verses ago. Mahadadya shesham. They're all aja, born into this material situation. Not the param param abedmi na but I have never experienced this supreme form uh, I behold as I see you now. Now all kinds of methods of theorizing have come to an end. All these arguments this person is putting forward to me, this high school student who only has the knowledge of what they've experienced in this material world, all of these silly arguments, they're all kicked out because vague me, because I know what I'm seeing before me is different from everything else I've experienced. Mm, not the param parama vidmi, Everything else in this creation of Lord Brahma is this charity vichara no, no, chewing the chew. It's all been experienced so many times, but Brahma's creation gives us this unique opportunity, especially in the human form of life, to find that which is not experienced. Um, anywhere else in, this, in these lower forms um, as a foolish human being who's um, not taking the opportunity. That was the, the ignorant covering of the living entity who thinks himself the Lord at sixth creation. Kick out this illusory covering. Take to the devotional service of the Lord. And not the param param Now I see. Now I see with eyes of knowledge, not guided by 
Mm, mm. The sense of smell, desirous of finding something to eat. You see these, uh, they have pigs who sniff out truffles. You know, they find something, oh, there it is. And then they sell them for some money so they can enjoy it. Mm. You have hawks with an incredible ability to see from a mile above the water they can spot a fish. All of their intelligence guided by Paramatma to find a fish to eat. Wow, spectacular. Amazing, sharp sense of sight. Imagine if I had such a sharp sense of sight, how much more nicely I could see Gornitai, how, how I could see the details on their lotus feet, I could see the Tulsi flower on their feet. No. If I had that sense of sight, I would use it to catch a fish. <laughs> what is this? If I had the abilities of a mystic power, the ability to fly, the ability to see in the dark, so many, so many animals have so many capabilities, senses far sharper than our own. Um, but we get to use our senses, albeit very limited, in the service of the Lord, and therefore they're perfect. Even though a sense is limited, uh, being engaged in the service of the Lord, then our intelligence, our senses become as good as the senses of Krishna, because they're used in his service. What a beautiful thing. Even though, even though so limited, we can the lane can cross mountains. Any thoughts, questions, corrections? Mm -hmm. I know we're sort of zipping through these, these um, creations, the natural creations, and now we've just entered into Brahma's creations. We're getting this really brief overview of sort of <laughs> like a time lapse of the whole creation. <laughs> and suddenly you get the earth now. And uh, yeah. <laughs> speaking about time lapses, someone was telling me that if you could have sort of an understanding of, of our Earth over, let's say, 500,000 years or something, the, the age of technological advancement, of buildings, of destruction of forests, all of these things. You know, in a, in a time-lapse video, the Earth just looks totally green and healthy, and then within like half a second, just, <laughs> just all the city, everything would just sprout suddenly. It's, uh, it was said in a very impactful way. I think they, they drew it all down to like this, the time lapse to the span of a day in 24 hours. Then our industrial revolution and, and destruction of natural resources takes place, you know, in, in 30 seconds of that 24 hour day. <laughs> Amazing how quickly, how quickly we can destroy. I, I do see your hand one second. Um, like a child, you know, they can't create, they can't maintain. So all they can do is destroy. This is a sign of the mode of ignorance. You know, I, I see um, kids, you know, they'll, they'll take the, the grass and they'll rip it in half. You know, they can't create grass, they can't maintain it, but they can rip it up. And we're, we're sort of um, human beings in this industrial age, this desire for sense gratification. It's geared so much by lower modes of nature that we're not able to maintain these nice gifts of Mother Bhumi. Instead, we just destroy it. Yes, Top I have a question on the first verse. Hmm. Actually, I have two questions. The hmm. first one is on the first verse, which is describing Brahma as an incarnation of the moral passion. Hmm. But there is such thing as a brain like the Supreme Personality is working. Uh, so, what does it mean to be an incarnation of Mm. It's kind of, I mean, incarnation of Krishna, it's one thing. What is the incarnation of mode of passion? Mm. An incarnation of the mode of passion, everything in its greatest degree is, um, everything in its greatest degree represents Krishna. So in its, in its purest form, just like, you know, what is, what is it to serve the Lord in anger? You know, Hanuman, burns down the city of Lanka. It's diametrically opposed to, you know, me getting in a fist fight with Steve because well, we both wanted to eat the same plate of halva. You know, it's not, 
It's not of the same quality. Or Lord Nishingadev, unlimitedly expressed anger. One devotee asked, you know, what, what do we do when, when we can't control our anger? Oh, just think of Lord Nishingadev. What is your anger? This petty little thing. So in its supreme degree, the mode of passion in its highest manifestation is this creation. I mean, we're seeing this description, how fantastic. The result of passion is creation. In its highest degree, representative of Krishna is Lord Brahma in the mode of passion creating the entire universe. So, you know, Lord Shiva doing his Tandava Nritya, dancing and destroying everything. In its highest degree, this mode of ignorance used to destroy the entire creation. So everything in, in, in its highest manifestation is representative of Krishna. Everything, ultimately everything, even in its lowest manifestation, is a representative of, of Krishna. But here Brahma is taking the role of the um, highest exhibition of the mode of passion. He is the Gunavatar of Krishna, the one empowered with the mode of passion to create. You need some passion to create. From goodness, creation doesn't come. Goodness maintains. But from passion, there's creation. So the Lord has this desire that the material creation take place. This Mahatattva and everything enters into it. All of these natural creations that we heard about. This is called Sarga. So this natural creation takes place. And then there's a secondary creation. Someone has to do it. Someone has to be the instrument of the Lord's will to give the living entities an opportunity to come back to Him. So who's going to be the instrument of the Lord for this secondary creation? Well, we have a candidate, this, uh, this person, Lord Brahma, the greatest devotee, and he's taking on that role as a service. So this Visarga, secondary creation, takes place under the auspices of the Lord through the medium of his guna avatar uh, in the mode of passion, Lord Brahma. Are you happy with that? Yeah, thank you. Okay, okay. just enough. making sure. The second question is, uh, people talk about the third eye, the pineal gland, <laughs> like in this age, the uh, third eye is not so much functional. Mm -hmm. Is there is something mentioned in the verse about the third eye? Is this a real thing or just? Yeah, there is actually. Bhu or Madhye. Bhulor Madhye in the 8th chapter of Gita says that the yogi focuses um, on the center of the eyebrows and while sitting. And I remember when I, when I read that um, <laughs> foolish enthusiasm uh, led me to sit there chanting my japa with my eyes crossed. And I was thinking that this is the way to focus on that place between the eyebrows. And after, after half a round my eyes became very uh, disturbed. <laughs> so I think this um, meditation, let's see, there was a reason I did it, I think in the translation, let's see, 810, prayana kale manasachalena bhaktya yukta yoga malena chayra bhubar madhye pranam avesha samya. One who at the time of death fixes his life air between the eyebrows. Mm. So there's there's um, some acknowledgement of this, um, the chakras being in a straight line. What is that? That's the uh, yam, yam, ram, yam. I think it's yam, the chakra that's that's placed in, in the forehead. Yeah. Um, hmm. It's not. I think one can definitely find information on this. There's a lot mentioned in Shastra in different places. I mean, Gita acknowledges it, that the yogi is focusing his life airs between the eyebrows, his pineal gland, his third eye. Um, but it's such a difficult practice. By the end of, of the eighth chapter, the conclusion wasn't that, okay, Arjuna, now set up your asana so high and sit there and meditate. That wasn't the conclusion. The conclusion was, act in Krishna consciousness. So all of these sort of concepts of, of third eye, of, of, of subtle mm, spiritual awakening in, in different yogic ways, achievement of ashtasiddhis, a lot of these things are impractical 
for our practice. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada has made it so simple that um, two eyes are enough to see the deities. One tongue is enough to chant the Maha Mantra. We don't need to seek awakening of some, or, or even understand certain concepts that are, that are so abstruse and, and difficult for, for us to understand. We can, we can hardly understand how to maintain good sadhana, never mind try to achieve some yogic perfection. But yeah, the, the concept is there. Of, of this third eye awakening, of this mm, chakra. All of the chakras, they're, they're all very powerful. I don't have too much knowledge about, about it. I'm just so thankful that I don't need to. Sometimes when I see all of these, all of these different topics in devotional service, um, it's, it's enough for me just to, just to understand the basic requirements of spiritual life given to us by, by Srila Prabhupada, just to wake up early, just to be steady, just to go to bed at the same time, wake up at the same time, eat at the same time, just to be regulated is so difficult, never mind to take it to the next level and perform um, severe austerities to awaken certain um, yogic perfections. Somewhere it's described, maybe it's in the pastime of Hiranyakashipu, when he's standing on his tippy toes and arms up, and he's meditating so severely. Um, I believe Prabhupada mentions, just see that the demons are capable of so much greater austerities than the devotees. Our austerity is that, you know, we, uh, we eat prasadam, you know. Our austerity is that, okay, just, just don't eat outside, you know. don't, don't eat at a restaurant, just cook something offered to Krishna, come to the temple. The austerity of the tongue is to eat Krishna prasad. The austerity of the ears is to hear Krishna katha. Austerity of the eyes is to engage in seeing the devotees and seeing the deities. Mm. My two eyes have enough austerities. I don't need to worry about the austerities of my third eye. Mm. Mm. Anything else before we engage in the austerities of the tongue? I'm so glad you said that, because the four Kumaras, they show up in, in Vaikuntha, and they're instantly changed from impersonalist to personalist by the smell of the Tulsi flowers on the Lord's lotus feet. Um, Pushpasada, one of the names of Tulsi, is the essence of all flowers, Pushpasada. Uh, it's such a powerful smell. So yeah, these, these different, instead of Granagya, instead of being led by the sense of smell to desirable objects for personal sense gratification, the devotee is, experiences the smoke. I mean, when we had the gardens of Tulsi in the front, I don't know if you remember, I mean, the smell of Tulsi was overpowering. I remember walking through those, that little pathway we have, and I remember just being blown away, but wow, Tulsi is so fragrant. I really miss those. Um. For anyone who doesn't know, that little semi-circle right there mm. in the temple had an actual forest, like twice yeah. as tall as me, just Easily. giant. And the devotees asked Prabhupada, they said, uh, you know, should, should we prune Tulsi back? Should, you know, it's kind of right in the walk. It was, Tulsi was like taking over that middle walkway. And Prabhupada said, no, one should bow to Tulsi before entering the temple. <laughs> so you kind of, you kind of have, you're forced to bow. You almost have to crawl on, on hands and knees to get through that path. Um, but yeah, and, and the bees would be maddened. I remember walking through that path and just, hundreds of bees. There would just always be bees. And the buzzing, and they're all serving Krishna with their buzzing. It's described in Vaikuntha when the bees are serving the Lord by their songs. Everyone else goes silent to hear them singing the glories of the Lord. And it just, it just felt like that. Like everything was united in serving Krishna. So yeah, Grahana Gya, the sense of smell. When you enter the temple and you smell the incense, you smell the Tulsi flowers. As opposed to like walking into <laughs> or I remember at elementary school, the second everyone pulled out their lunches, I'd be like, oh, just the smell would knock me over. Or uh, walking in a, a, a 
food court of a mall. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the food court of the mall. So many, so many nasty things. So many smells. And then we were, we were talking. You were mentioning that when the devotees were remembered by different people, they, they said that the devotees smelled funnier. You, yes. you had the, some, some sort of story like that, where it's this one sense of smell becomes perverted um, by engaging it in material energy. All of one's senses become perverted. This jaundice of material life, it's described in Nectar of Instruction, that, that sweet things taste bitter. And you see it, sometimes people, they smell our cooking, they smell the different spices, and they're turned off. Or they see, you know, devotees, and they're turned off. Their senses are perverted in such a way that when they see spiritual life, they recoil in horror. And their, their sukriti hasn't advanced to that point. They're, this literally happened when we were doing our play, and Radha got locked out of her car. So the tow truck showed up at some manga, the hour of the middle of the night. And he's like, oh, what's that smell? And I'm there going, I'm smelling Tulsi and flowers. Like, what do you mean? And he's like, that smells horrible. He couldn't handle being here. I don't know so what odd. he was smelling. Who knows what he is. so weird. Amazing. And he smelled of cigarettes, and I'm like. <laughs> 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 he oh, God. smell fresh air? Right? Right? Yeah. <laughs> you smell fresh air? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I remember, yeah, being, being kids and you're at the gas station and your parents are pumping the gas and you kind of roll down the window like, oh, that kind of smells good. <laughs> Some sort of funny things in the material world, certain things smell good. It's odd. Yeah. You had something? Yeah, you were talking about how the animals all except the snake get Oh, uh, I wasn't talking, yeah. Prabhupada says, yeah, yeah, only the snake is so envious that it can't be tamed by satisfaction of the belly and and a place to sleep. So how are they tamed by sound? There is descriptions that they're tamed by, by um, the expert snake charmer. Um, but Prabodha Ananda Saraswati Thakur just straight up says, snap their fangs out and their um, um by engaging in devotional service, the poisonous fangs of the serpents of the senses are, are the protkata, Prodkatha uh, means extracted, the things are extracted. So we don't need to give temporary solutions to charming these snakes of the senses, just rip those things right out. Yeah. So envious. There's so many stories of the big ones strangling the master, they can't be controlled. Yeah, yeah, there, yeah there's, there's so many. I mean, there's, yeah, I saw, I saw some video recently, the guy was holding his, his snake, and, and he describes after, he says, I've had this snake for like, I don't know how many years, it's never done anything, and suddenly it just, just shoots out and bites him, or someone goes to hold it and bites someone else, and they can't be controlled, envious, the nature of envy, um, envious creatures. Imagine taking that birth. Imagine being so envious you take birth as a snake. Sadi Sripa, various types of reptiles. But then we have Vasuki and Antashish. We have wonderful snakes also. It's making me appreciate those churches more. They're extra daring all <laughs> dancing with those snakes. It is. We have, uh, in Hawaii, we have the baby black blind snake. He's, he doesn't seem too envious. <laughs> if anyone's ever, I haven't seen one in a long time. Maybe because of all the Roundup sprayed in, in grasses, they're all dying. But here in, in the Hawaii temple, I remember, um, like when Bennett and I were clearing all those rocks around the jackfruit tree, you know, 15 years ago, you would have found 15 baby black lion snakes. I remember even recently, a couple of years ago, you flipped a rock in the back and, and two of them were underneath. So, but I haven't seen any recently even well. They're little and black and, and they're only about, you know, six inches long maybe is a big one. And they, um, and they have little scales and, and a little forked tongue. And uh, it looks like a worm. But it's it looks like a worm. It's a, it's a little black. Yeah, but it's a it's a completely a snake. It's quite it's quite wonderful. I've seen that. You've seen 